Hello, this is Bridges Live, why everything comes online here. You are visiting with Dr. Paul. I'm Dr. Paul, and I have another guest here with me today. And why we're all coming online, and if you have any questions, I probably won't get to it to answer them today. But what I want to do is answer them later, because Mr. Carl Snowden has a, a long, tremendous history, and it won't get time today to answer any of your questions but please you can always inbox me of all your social media and all your other ways that you see dr paul and bridges live um without further ado i want to introduce mr carl snowden um people who haven't don't know who you are that's their fault <laughs> but the what i do want to talk about and really get a hold of is we don't use the word activist all that anymore and you are a true activist like my parents were we're activists meaning that you engage disrupt and can help put back together because i think an activist is not just causing mayhem and walking away but an activist is to stay there so it actually gets rebuilt to where it can move forward what do you think about that mr carl i think that's a good um, definition of activist i always i think i would also add to that someone who has been enlightened and inspired and affected by the environment in which they live. Um, I, you know, during this pandemic, I had to go and uh, get a shot for the virus. And one of the questions that they ask you when you get your, take this particular shot is, are you allergic to anything? <laughs> and I said, yes. And of course, they want to know what I was allergic to. And I told them, racism. Uh, racism has a tremendous impact on one's psyche, one emotions, one physical being. And so um, part of being an activist is to be enlightened. And once you understand the world in which you live, you have to react to it. It's just, uh, James Baldwin once said that a conscious black man mm -hmm. is a black man that is always, always enraged. Malcolm X had it another way. He said, the more you understand what is occurring around you, you become angry. Right. And he said, there's nothing wrong with being angry because angry people are the ones who change the world. And so uh, I had the good fortune of meeting James Baldwin. I'd interviewed him. I used to have my own television and radio programs. So I got a chance to meet James Baldwin. And I think his understanding of what, were, what was happening in the world certainly helped to impact on me and my understanding. What so, going on. so how you know because we don't have we have you and so i look at myself is you're 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 our james baldwin to me i think you are i mean a person that like i said for you people who don't know who carl snow is, that is more your fault and maybe you can understand when after you find out and do your own little reading but the fbi issue right about you being followed and, and so you we have to put ourselves out there and that's got to be a fearful thing for yourself but how do you talk to those people who are afraid to step forward into the light let me share that um fbi story because it is an interesting one um first when martin luther king jr was murdered i was 14 years old and his murder uh impacted on me greatly I'll never forget the day that he was assassinated. A group of us were standing in Annapolis on the corner, as kids used to do in that day, just conversing. And a young black teenage boy came by, and he said, uh, they've shot Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. And of course, we were stunned, but the word was they shot him, not that they killed him. And so a few of us went up to a... Uh, on West Street in Annapolis, and they used to be, they would have television sets playing in the window. So you could actually uh, see the television sets that were playing. And so we went over to the television sets, uh, went over to this window that had these television sets on display. And we couldn't hear. We could see Martin Luther King Jr., but we couldn't hear what he was saying. So another friend came along, and this really dates me. There used to be what was called transition, transistor radios. What a handheld radio, you click it on. And there was a local television, a radio station called WANN. 
and one of the fellows clicked on the station and the announcer said Martin Luther King Jr. was shot this evening and he died. And one of the black kids that was with us started kicking the ground and muttering. They've done it again, they've done it again, he said. And that was my first appreciation for uh, how assassination can change the course of history. So when Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered, um, remember I'm only 14 at the time, it, it had an incredible impact on me. And in 1970, um, was the year, I was a high school student, 10th grader, sophomore, and an English teacher required that I read a book, two chapters from the book called the Autobiography of Malcolm X. And at the end of reading the book, I was in reading these two chapters, I was to come back and give an oral report. Well, at the time, I was not a very uh, involved student. I might have been a C average student. I didn't take school very seriously. And my idea was to take this autobiography of Malcolm X, um, really skim it. I wasn't going to really read it and then come back and wing it. Um, and I picked up the autobiography of Malcolm X and read a chapter called Nightmare, which mm. is the opening yep. chapter. Yep. Dr. Paul, I literally couldn't put the book down. It's the first book I read from cover to cover in one setting, and it literally changed my life. He raised questions during his autobiography, things I'd never thought of. Why are black people in the condition they're in? Right. Why don't we know our history? Right. I mean, one of the amazing things I read that just, I've never thought of it all my life. He, in his autobiography, he said that Jesus was a black man. I said, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> yeah, like, okay, uh, what's going on here with this? Right. And, and as a result of that, Everything changed. I mean, I just started reading and getting involved and becoming what is called an activist. And between the ages of 15 and 22, I had gotten involved in the anti-war movement. There was something called the Black Consciousness Movement that was occurring. Mm -hmm. I was part of demonstrations for African Liberation Day. I was traveling. I was meeting people. All these things were happening. And then at the age of 22, years of age, I heard a uh, lecture given by a man named Ralph Nader, who had come to speak at St. John's College. And one of the things Ralph Nader said at the time was that if you were an activist, more than likely, the FBI had a file on you. Right. Well, almost as a lock, I uh, sent away the request my file, thinking, <laughs> I don't know, surely they don't have a file on me. Well, to my surprise, I get a back of response to my freedom information request, and they said they did have a file on me, and that uh, because of the various provisions of the law, they couldn't send me anything but a redacted copy. So I get a part of a file back, and it's got all these black marks on it, blackout marks, and I'm saying, what in the world could what, what could be in this file? And very fortunate for me, very, very fortunate for me, a friend of mine had not long graduated from college, from law school, and decided to represent me. And we filed a lawsuit against the FBI. I became one of the first Marylanders to win a federal lawsuit against the FBI. And the judge in the case was a man named Kaufman, Frank Kaufman, who served on the Baltimore District Federal Court. And he got to see the entire file um, complete. And he found it so outrageous what the FBI had done. Um, at the age of 15 and 16, um, they had literally kept me under surveillance. They uh, met my teachers. I went to a school called the Key School, they interviewed teachers of mine, friends of mine, all on the, I, I didn't know this was going on. So for these years, all these years I'm out there being active, not realizing that the FBI had opened this file up. Well, we won the lawsuit, and I got access to the file. And I told people, uh, the reason I made my file public, anybody can see it, it's on. Mm -hmm. I gave it to the ACLU. 
they put it on their website, uh, the Maryland ACLU put it on the website because I wanted people to see what government could and did do. And what they are doing. And what they are doing. There is an absolute connection to what you just said. Right. But of course, people find it difficult to believe that the government, the federal government would be interested in a 16-year-old kid um, and open up a file on them, which they did. So we won the lawsuit. We won a monetary settlement because the judge found that they had violated my constitutional rights. But they also gave me something else as a result of that, that lawsuit. I was very clear eyed what government can do. And that's why I'm very well conscious of the, the raid that took place, the breach of the US Capitol, and the way they treated those insurrectionists, extremists, and the way they treated civil rights leaders of that day. Just the contrast couldn't be any greater. And so it gives you a consciousness and an understanding of how government really works. And of course, I would later go into government, become an elected official myself, mm -hmm. serve at some of the highest levels of government, and saw things firsthand. Yeah, I have the pleasure of knowing certain things, having lived it. Um, I know how government works. I know what police can do. And I know that there are many, 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 many people unaware of the power of government and what that government can do. And as you probably read very recently, a black man who was a detective from the New York Police Department gave a deathbed, deathbed confession on his role in the assassination of Malcolm X. Incredible stuff. And it would be difficult for people to believe it if the facts were not there to prove it. Uh, Malcolm X was a victim of what was called the COINTEL program. Correct. This is a counterintelligence program that was created on the Jagger Hoover. It has a new name, it's called Black Extremist now, but it used to be called the COINTEL program. And they literally maintained files on every major and minor <laughs> civil rights leader you could think of. It's unbelievable. And no black man or woman uh, who have challenged the system had been affected by it. That's why I'm not joking when I said I'm allergic to racism. I know what it does and what it can do to individuals. And so by getting this FBI file and being able to read what was in it, learning who the informants were using, what techniques were used, it helped prepare me for my career because I paid attention. If you ask the average person who walks the streets of America every day, they never look up, they, they look don't. straight ahead. And if they only knew what this government is doing today, right now, how much of what we think is privacy has already been invaded. Um, I'm not related to the man Edward Snowden, obviously, but we bear the same name. Mm -hmm. And what most people don't know is what Edward Snowden really revealed. I mean, most people think that Edward Snowden was just some guy who uh, revealed certain secrets, but it was more than that. It was. What Edward Snowden did was prove a if any if this happened in Russia, they would call it fascism. What Edward Snowden revealed was that every American, every American, has a file on him or her, and that when you use the cell phone, when you use any digital devices. They create what they call a digital imprint. Mm -hmm. And so the government is capable of knowing within minutes what you ate for breakfast, where you went, et cetera. Most people have no idea how technology works. So when you got a cell phone, for example, uh, <clears throat> the cell phone is a tracking device. As long as you got that cell phone, uh, you can be tracked. And for people who get their cell phone and the cell phone says, can we have permission to indicate your location? And you put decline. Uh, there are people who believe that it's been declined. Right. Not knowing how the technology works. Uh, Dick Gregory, years ago, uh, I had the, I was very fortunate to have met Dick Gregory. But Dick I was Gregory, all, I was fortunate enough to listen to Dick Gregory. So you remind I know he was taken from us too, and we we're not gonna get into that, but I agree. That's why you are very important to me to us 
in 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 this time. You are Dick Gregory. You are our civic leader who has been there. Dick Gregory once said, cable television. I had never thought of this before. <laughs> he said, cable television, you can project an image in, as we know. And <laughs> what he really got me to understand is how the technology works. The same way I can project uh, images in and sound in, I can also receive images and sound. Mm -hmm. If you've got a cable television in your home, the technology allows for people to be able to see even when the television is off. Correct. Because it's a listening device. There is the easiest way for people to understand this. You know, the new, they have this new system called the door ringer. Yes. The door ringer allows you to be any place, anywhere in the world and see who comes in your door. It, it, the concept is exactly the same. So if you've got a door ringer and you can use your cell phone to be able to monitor what's going on in your home and you're not be at home, imagine the technology that exists today that allows the government or anybody else who is um, savvy enough to be able to do the same thing. And so it's important for activists uh, to understand the system, how it works, and to be prepared. And one thing I'd like to just share with you, that most people don't have no idea, and this is not hidden. People can Google what I'm about to tell them and see what see it for themselves. Following the disturbance, the civil unrest, uh, the revolt uh, following uh, Freddie Gray's death, six years ago, right after that uh, riot took place, so-called riot, um, the government set up a task force. And the task force was made up of various governmental agencies and people don't know this, but to this day, there are men and women, mostly men, who participated in that. The government had used what's called drones, uh, flew in, took photographs, now through facial identification, you can identify people. And there are people who are being prosecuted today, six years afterwards, who are in federal prison, young people. And most people don't even know it. They don't even realize it's going on and it's been in place. Uh, in Baltimore City, when they had the Baltimore civilian, the, the Baltimore plane yeah, that was flying in and taking these surveillance. Eye, eye in the sky. Yeah. It, it's amazing. And um, so one of the things I think is important is to make sure we get information out to people, that people understand that uh, it is a struggle. And the struggle is involving control. The more information you know, uh, the more difficult to control you. It's that simple. And, and that's why I really want to, that's why I do these shows. I do a lot of these shows, whether it be on abuse, whether it be on domestic violence, whether it be on emotional trauma, and the information's moving forward, but it's not sinking into the many. It sinks into the few, but, you know, just because you sing with a choir doesn't mean everyone can hear it. So my concern is, <laughs> How do we get it into the many when they're so mentally blocked and they're not reading? They're not. Well, reading, reading is definitely a problem. And it's not by accident. No. There's no accident no. whatsoever that reading is becoming a problem. But here's what is happening. Um, black people are much more susceptible to truth than they were in the past. For example, when I told you a few moments ago that a black man um, on his deathbed confessed to killing Malcolm X, mm -hmm. years ago that would have been a shocking uh, revelation. Today, most black people understand the government was involved in the assassination of Malcolm X. Right. Oh, overwhelmingly, the majority of our people understand that Martin Luther King Jr. death was not by happenstance. I happen to have gotten to meet uh, Mrs. King, Coretta Scott King, we built a memorial to her in Annapolis, outside of Annapolis. It's called the Coretta Scott King Memorial Garden. And her daughter, Bernice King, came and dedicated this memorial. And when you go to the memorial, on this huge plaque, uh, approved by Coretta Scott King before she died, was a statement that the government killed her 
husband. Husband. Incredible revelation. Um, and there are people who are still living today who know what the government's role was. Andrew Young, for example. Walter Fauntleroy, who had a sort of mental breakdown um, some years back, is up in age now, he's in his 80s, not in good health. But Walter Fauntleroy actually sat on a panel that investigated the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and um, John F. Kennedy. And so he was privy to information that most Americans will never see. Um, and he told Dick Gregory and me that if he ever said what he actually knew, knew, he felt his life would be come to an end. So uh, it's, it's just amazing uh, how much information exists but people have to be willing to read, analyze, and use common sense. Just common sense. But there's so much to me when I talk about cog cognitive development, a lot of Blacks are short in cognitive development because of the emotional trauma of the area that has blocked them from developing into um, critical thinking. And that's a school system, right? So when we are referring to the next thing that's coming or it, the thing that's on the rise, it's civil war. Is it here? Is it, uh, is it coming up over the hill? Where do you we think came, we, Dr. Paul, we came very close. Right. Losing what we call a democracy. Yes. We, people have no idea how close we came. And ironically, ironically, the two things that saved this nation, and I mean this literally saved the nation as we know it today, was the intelligence community, they had their own agenda. Um, there were things that Trump was saying and doing mm -hmm. that offended them greatly. And the second thing were black people. Most people had no idea the role that black people played in the defeat of Donald Trump. Had black people not come out in the numbers they came. You know, Pennsylvania is a swing state, for example. Oh, correct. And if you knew the turnout in Philadelphia by black people, incredible. Georgia was a swing state. Georgia, what's supposed to happen? It was black people, and particularly black women, mm -hmm. coming to the polls in record numbers. They, they came from places you've never heard of before, standing in those long lines. Nevada, where the Latino community and the black vote made a significant difference. They were the swing states, uh, is what gave Biden the election. And it was black people who he himself has said he's internally grateful to because had it not been for black people, uh, Joe Biden would not be in the White House. And had, had the intelligence community did what was requested of them by former President mm -hmm. Trump, this thing we call the democracy would have come to an end. It, it would have crumbled. What, what upset me most is looking at the numbers of the number of black men who voted for. Donald Trump. That was yeah. That was shocking. Of, well, remember this, um, and I, I the two examples I give that I think this illustrates where we are. First of all, never forget that we live in a capitalist society. Correct. Capitalism is, you know, on the money on the on the on the currency. It says in God we trust. That's not true. Capitalism creates its own deity. Mm -hmm. And there are people who really believe that if, you know, if you get enough money, you know, that's, that's, that's what you should be fighting for. Get as much money as you can. <laughs> and enough so money you've seen as a person, huh? That's what they yeah. think. Yeah. Well, and they're foolishly too, by the way. But, you know, take the role that Little Wayne played in the election. Little Wayne is a rapper who came out for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. The story behind the story is this. Donald, the uh, little Wayne, was facing 10 years in prison. He, he was. For having guns. And so he cut a deal, just like he did to all the time. He cut a deal and in exchange, and thank God he didn't have the impact they thought he was going to have, but in exchange for him supporting Donald Trump, mm -hmm. uh, they gave him a party. And there were black people, black men, who foolishly 
believe. Well, if Little Wayne says that Donald Trump's okay, he must be okay. And so there was an uptick in black men um, voting for Donald Trump. But anyone that knows anything about the history of our movement in this country, we've always had that. We've had black men do some horrible things to each other. Never forget that it was black men mm -hmm. that beat Fannie Lou Hamer. That's right. They beat her unconscious at the request of white law, or law enforcement officials. They beat her. They beat her unconsciously. There were black men that played the role of overseer mm -hmm. in plantations. Yes. Um, so I say all that to say that there's a movie that's playing now called uh, <clears throat> Judas and the Black Messiah. And it's an incredible movie. It's on the assassination of Fred Hampton. And uh, the movie is a wonderful movie, but it misses one thing in the entire movie. And you have to have lived the period to understand it. You can go to that movie and you will find the movie. It's an incredible movie, except that the images are wrong. They have this brother who's playing Fred Hampton. He doesn't look like he's 21, because he's not. They have the sister who is Fred Hampton's fiance. Yeah. She's only 19 years old in real life. In real this life. Woman is right, much older. Right. And so because people don't get to see young people at the ages of 21 and Mark Clark at 22 and mm -hmm. this woman at 19, you're looking at the movie and you're thinking the government's doing this to grown men and women, adults. And it's just was not the young people. Young people, the government turned the full force on. And so one of the things that came out of the assassination of Malcolm X a decision was made that there will be no more George Jacksons or Malcolm X coming out of prison. And they did a very shrewd thing. They, they did you a great not, job of creating that too. Yeah, you cannot, um, there was a time if you went to prison, you could get a Pell Grant and get a college degree. Why in prison? They ended that, you can't do that now. Books used to be something that inmates would, 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 would use to pass away their time and in some instances raise their consciousness. You go to prison today, they got Xboxes. Right. They got television. Right. They got these games you play. Right. Because those games will not raise your consciousness. Correct. They will have you doing the time. And they know what they're doing. They, they're, they're, they're now in a very selective they pay attention to what people read, what they watch, um, in order to be able to predict who will be another Malcolm or another George Jackson. And a lot of times you will find men and women who go to prison, they find Allah, they find Jehovah, they find Jesus, they say they change. But when they leave prison, they leave Muhammad, Allah, right where they found them, in, right. prison. in prison. They don't bring it out because instead of those religious being religious conversions, they become handy ways of surviving prison. They become, you get a group of people who kind of watch your back. Um, so we've seen a tremendous change. Should blacks, you know, it's not a should, but this is a time of pandemic to pivot and pivot in the black community, which means is to rise, I believe. Starting our own education system in schools from elementary and up, I think this is our time to do that. We, uh, Malcolm, I love Malcolm. Malcolm X once said, only a fool allows his enemies to teach their children their history. It couldn't be, couldn't be any better. <clears throat> We're not going to, in a system that was not designed to liberate us, Correct. find our liberation in that system. So one of the things I've been advocating now for a number of years is that Churches that have Sunday schools also need to have Saturday schools. Sunday schools is where you get your religious teachings mm -hmm. um, based on your spirituality, your belief. Secular Saturday schools is where you get to learn the true history of your people. And we must teach our own true history. For example, if I ask people generally, well-read, who um, George Washington is, 
they could quickly tell me what it was. Yeah. George Washington was the first president of the United States. And then I asked them who was James Madison. They again can tell me, you know, James Madison, well, he he contributed to the Federalist Papers. He, you know, he was one of the founding fathers. And then I said, Well, who's Madison Washington? I said, who? Who? I said, who's Madison Washington? And words are so important. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln allegedly gave emancipation, that the Emancipation Proclamation was supposed to free people. Mm -hmm. So when I tell people that in 1841, 22 years before Lincoln even wrote the so-called Emancipation Proclamation, Madison Washington freed 135 black men and women. Freedom took a, over a boat. He, was, he, he created a mutiny and was able to free people. So we people know about Frederick Douglass, they know about Harriet Tubman, but they've never heard of Madison Washington. And that's not by accident. No. It is not by accident. And so we have to teach this history. Most people have no idea, for example, New York City, New York State. They don't know that New York is named after the Duke of York. Who's yep. the Duke of York? He was the American slave master. That's right. He invented it. He perfected it. I live in a place called Annapolis, Maryland. Annapolis is named after the Duke of York's daughter, Queen Anne. I didn't know Queen that. Anne is, oh, yeah. Queen Anne was in the slave trading business. It's not by accident or happenstance or coincidence that Kunta Kinte arrived in Annapolis in 1767 in a city that was named after a, a slave trader and that he was put up for sale uh, in this city. And so people can live in a place. And not know. And not know. You know how many New Yorkers, native New Yorkers, have no idea who the Duke of York was? Well, you know, I and I was talking with my wife recently, and my mother was a prolific reader she was super smart she was an activist though she was in the chicago riots my dad was a black panther in chicago so that type of education was a drum beat in our house right so knowing where you are she's to say three things know where you are know who you're speaking with and know what you are <laughs> <laughs> what a wise woman oh those are the three things. And I've been teaching my kids and anyone I've ever taught, I, I would say the same thing in just a different format, but it was the same thing. Know who you are, what you are, and where you are. You better, if you don't know, you lost. Well, there was a guy in Baltimore City. <laughs> I was a former delegate, a guy named Kenneth Webster, who, by the way, introduced the legislation that made Dr. King's birthday a state holiday in the state of Maryland in 1974. Uh, Maryland became the second state in the nation to honor Dr. King with such a holiday in his name. And uh, Kenneth Webster used to say, if your head is naughty and your nose is snotty and you don't know, ask somebody. <laughs> it was a way of just telling people that, you know, it's OK not to know, but ask. But if ask. you don't understand certain things, ask, you know, ask some fundamental questions. And one of the things that my mother, by the way, lived to be 104 years old. She passed in May of last year. And um, she was wise beyond her years. Incredible woman, just an incredible woman who understood what it meant to be black in America and to raise children and all of that. In fact, she taught me something that I want to share with you. Um, and I think it gives people listening some perspective of who I am. If you ask the average black man or woman in America the following question, you, if you were to say to them, it's midnight in Annapolis or Prince George's County or Chicago or Detroit, wherever, and you are confronted by a racist police officer, your son or daughter who's teenagers, are confronted by racist police officers and they call them out their name and then they tell them to shut the F up. You ask parents, black parents, what do you advise your kids to do? And whether it's President Barack Obama, who said he would give the advice that I'm about to tell you, or whether it's the average person on the street, they would tell you, tell your kids to shut up. Mm -hmm. And they give this sage advice, they say, because they know that the kid could be right, could be dead right. 
And so they want them to come home safely because they know about the Michael Browns and the Trayvon Martins and the Sandra Bland. And so they give that what they call survival uh, <clears throat> recommendation so they can live for another day. I don't tell my grand, my children and grandchildren that. To shut up, keep quiet. Because when you understand history, you can understand why. We're living in the year 2021. Yes, sir. If you went to a group of black people in 1921, and I gave the same scenario I told you just now, and you ask those parents in 1921, what would they tell their children to do? They would say they tell them, keep quiet, right. survive another day. Go to 1821, same thing, 1721. Since black people arrived in this country, they've been telling black youth of every generation, keep quiet, survive. Well, the truth of the matter is that's not what we should be saying to our children and our grandchildren. What we should be saying is we refuse to accept the society but because you're black, you got to be quiet when somebody insults you, threatens to injure you. No, we need to raise consciousness and raise hell. We need to be able to say, we're not going to have in a society where our children and grandchildren, merely because they're black, will be forced to keep quiet. Because that there's, fear silences them. Well, there's, there's, this, there's this experience that the minute I related to you, everybody will see it. And this is what I mean by being allergic to racism. Here's a typical example that happens every day in America. You're driving down the highway, just normally driving down the highway. And all of a sudden you hear whoo, 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 a siren goes on. You instantly tighten up on the steering wheel. Wondering, is this police going to pull me over? And when the police go by you, a you say, thank God. Yep. Thank God for what? You didn't do anything. I, but in this society, because of the racism, mm. you realize that what would be a normal traffic stop for others could be your death day. And so we've got to change that in America. We've got to insist that uh, we as a people do not accept our oppression. And the minute you start telling your children to shut up, be quiet, survive. Remember, George Floyd was cooperating when he died. Mm -hmm. Walter Scott in South Carolina, he was running away. They shot him in the back. Tomorrow Rice, 12 years old, was murdered. Don't tell our children to be quiet. Don't tell black people to be quiet. We need to be telling our people, we've got to rise up. We've got to insist that we be treated as human beings and given the same rights as other human beings are given. No other group of people on the face of the earth tell their children to be quiet. To shut up when they're being insulted. Yeah. Jews would never tell their children to nope. shut up. Italians don't tell their children to shut up. No other group of people in America tell their children to shut up. We do. And you know, as one who studied history, it's got to do with the psychological and physiological experiences that we've had of the people. Can you imagine what it must be like? My mother, as I told you, died at 104. To, 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 to see a lynching, to wipe up the blood as a maid in a home where somebody's been murdered. Michael Brown in 2014, when he was killed in Ferguson, yeah. he left his body exposed for four hours. I know. You know what that does to children? You know what that does to people who look? This kind of meshes that that sends. But it, it leaves the message they wanted to send. And they did oh, that yeah. on purpose. And so we have to respond. We can't, this, this nonsense that <clears throat> the only response we can have is what is approved by others. It's just foolish. We, we have to respond. And when we respond, it's got to be strategic. As we've done in the past, by the way. We have done things as a people that's just incredible it's, we have shown the ingenuity but too too many i you know i belong to some other fraternities and organizations and things like that because that's where my life but i think so many people fraternities organizations and churches are quiet they're silent they're it's like where did they go they like i thought you guys were behind me they're like <laughs> nope we are we're shh, shut up be quiet we're gonna 
write this up. We're going to put it in a newspaper. No, we should be out here moving. You know, I think that what is going on, um, the so-called, what they call the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. which again, I, it's important that generations know this. The Black Lives Movement is no more than the manifestation of an ongoing movement that's had many names over the years, whether it was the uh, Black Power Movement, whether it was the Black Consciousness Movement, um, Black Lives Matter is connected to that movement. And so it's important that we make sure that young people in particular are educated uh, to their history. Because if they're educated to their history, they will realize the tremendous amount of resources that exist in our community. Here's an example of something that you certainly will remember and people younger than you. There was a time that the numbers, numbers, illegal numbers that were played on the street you didn't find out what the number was by turning on the television and waiting for the 730. There was a system that existed in Black America that everybody who needed to know what the number was by five o'clock knew it. And this is before we had cell phones. Right, this right. Is, we had the power to be able to communicate. In Africa, we refer to it as a drum, mm -hmm. but we had a way of communicating with each other. Most people don't realize how powerful that system is and how that system, when used properly, uh, can be able to move our people in ways that we cannot depend on the media to do. You know, the media will never tell the story that we need to be told. We have to tell our own story. And we have to use our own means of doing that. And so I wrote a book um, last year um, called um, some people watch clocks, I watch people. And the reason I wrote the book is I wanted people to understand that we have to do our own interpretation of the events that we live through. Correct. And, and as an example of this, just one example, if you ask most people where were they at in 9-11, when 9-11 took place, most people who were living during that time can tell you the exact place, what they were doing when 9-11 happened. And then you ask them a couple of questions about 9-11, and they either have forgotten or they didn't even think of that. For example, 9-11, for people who paid attention, we had a system in 9-11. It was called, uh, the system that was in place was to alert people whenever there was a terrorist attack. Right. So if it was high terrorist attack, it was red. It was yellow for caution. It was orange. They had these colors, and these colors meant something. And they reported it on television. This system, the system. And if you're, as, if you're old enough to remember the following, there was a time in America that there were only three networks. This before CNN, right, right. before 20. Television used to be over by 2 a.m. in the morning. But before television was over, you would hear this, beep, television would go blank. And then this voice would say, if there was a national emergency, if there was an emergency, this is the national emergency broadcast system you will be tell, told where to go. And they spent millions, billions of dollars over the years affecting our system. Well, when 9-11 happened, it didn't go off. Didn't go off. And if people would Google emergency broadcast system 9-11, they'd find out that uh, there was hearings held on why it didn't go off, and American people were never told because it's top secret hearing. But they right. held hearings. I know. That just didn't go off. And then you ask people, well, you do remember we used to have this red, yellow, and blue, a uh, yellow and orange system. So what happened? Why don't we use that system anymore? And they don't even remember. <laughs> they don't even know when the system stopped, why we don't use it. And just so people know, the reason the system is no longer used, it was too effective. Remember, this is a capitalist society. Correct. And what they discovered was our behavior is affected by our fear. Mm -hmm. So when they put up red or they put up yellow, people stop going to the malls, they stop going to tele to uh, movie stations, movies and doing things because of fear. And so the government found it was too effective, so they quietly withdrew it. And now the system that's in place, this facial identification system, which is what Edward Snowden was helping to expose, is an incredible system because it identifies people 
who think that nobody's paying attention or watching. So do you think this, because this pandemic also started another system for their next movement. And that's why I believe they shut everyone indoors. This is not a conspiracy, but they sh- they shut everyone indoors. And now they're changing all that money into electronic money. Well, that's already happened. I mean, right. we're, we're going to be a cashless society. Very, I mean, it won't. <clears throat> um, the notion of having money, physical money. Um, I mean, it's, it's going to be a thing of the past. By the way, um, there will be no returning to normalcy. No, that's not going to happen. No, what? But trained now, what, right? This you remember nine eleven. Most people just that's why it's important to remember your history. That America changed after nine eleven. Things that we would never have thought be possible. I mean, people go to airports, take off their shoes. <laughs> uh, the kind of security system that's in place, people have gotten used to personal invasion, thing of privacy. You almost give that up. Well, with the pandemic, remember, uh, America will never be the same again. The, the way we have learned to control people, the behavior, uh, we won't go back to business as usual. And by the way, that's a good thing that we not go back to business as usual, because going back to business as usual would mean um, the continuing oppression and exploitation of Black people. What the, what the pandemic did was highlight the disparities that exist in our society they, that are so glaring. Black and brown people dying at record numbers um, during this pandemic. Um, black and brown communities not being able to get access to quality medical uh, care. It's amazing. And it's waking up a lot of people to what the future will bring. And so one of the things I think that will happen and this is a good thing that will come out of this, as a result of being home, as a result of being um, in, people are paying a lot more attention to stuff. They're reading more. Things are slowing down a little bit. Conversations like you and I are having, people now paying attention to, because they don't have all these other distractions going on in the house. I mentioned earlier Madison, Washington. You'll be surprised how many people viewing this program will go and Google Madison Washington and will be stunned they never heard of him. These are people who got doctoral degrees. These are people who matriculated through an educational system that have refused to teach them their own history. And it turns on a light bulb. So when they find out who Madison Washington is and that he 22 years before Lincoln freed more blacks than Lincoln did, by the way, as you know, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free any blacks. Didn't free anyone. It wasn't meant to free anybody. It, it, it was aimed at Confederate states yep. that didn't recognize, didn't recognize Lincoln as their president and just ignored it. Um, but anyway, this guy literally did free people. And the way when people learned how Madison Washington was able to free people, the mutiny he led, how brilliant he was, uh, they want to learn more about who he was and why the country feels to tell us more. Most people who lived on the era I lived are unaware of the fact that Ewing Newton had a PhD. Ewing Newton was a 22 year old college student when he started the Black Panther Party, 22 years old. Angela Davis was 26 when she was arrested. Yes. She too had a PhD. It's just this notion that the people who are leaving the movements were just these militants who were uneducated, poppycock. These were well-educated men and women mm-hmm. who took the time to look at the system that was in place and analyze the system critically and made some incredible um, conclusions. One of the things that Malcolm X helped me with was to understand the difference between reading and comprehension. There's a, there's a huge difference, and that's, again, that's that critical thinking of understanding. That's why I always say with Bridges Live, I want to do information understanding. I, I just don't want you to be informed about Madison, Washington, but understand now, because once you understand, you have a choice. That is right. the only reason you'll have a choice is when you fully understand, now you can make an informed decision. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, You know... Um, ah. There are people watching the program. When I tell you what you will know, but a lot of people don't know. Fannie Lou Hamer, she had a sixth grade education. She was uh, 
one of 20, she was the youngest of 20. Her parents were sharecroppers in Mississippi, Mississippi sharecroppers. At the tender age of 22, she went to a hospital for what was called a female trouble, minor trouble that uh, women subject, women who uh, suffer from certain infections can have. And generally the problem is solved with appropriate antidote to the infection. They sterilized her. They gave her a her, her, uh, hysterectomy without her consent. She didn't know it. Years later, she would discover that she had been sterilized. This government never ever, the doctors rather, who performed that hysterectomy took away her right to bear, bear children, never had to pay the price. And nothing ever happened to her. George Washington Carver, who was a great scientist, most people don't know that at the age of 13, he was castrated. Castrated. And you ask why? Because he was, he was the playmate. He was a slave, as you know, George Washington Carver. He was a playmate of young, a young girl. And his master was scared that he might attempt to have sex with his daughter. So when he turned 13, they castrated him. George Washington Carver was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. He revolutionized the whole agriculture industry. Mm -hmm. We would never have any offsprings. We are not, I think, too many Black people looking for the Savior to come save us. And we can only save ourselves. And until we learn how to comprehend, ask questions, and not be so afraid to get the help. We we will stay enslaved, in cage, and in prison while sitting in your home. Well, and 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 I, the reason I want to encourage people to read because sometimes you will hear things on television. If you're not informed, you will assume that it's true. Mm -hmm. For example, last year. Major news stations reported that Donald Trump was the first president in the history of the United States to cage children, put children in cages. And most people found that offensive and terrible, but it's not true. Not yet. He's not the first president. Japanese Americans went in turn in 1941. Yeah. I'm a Democratic president. Yeah. Anybody know anything but Native Americans? There was a guy named Kit Carson. Mm -hmm. Famous so-called uh, scout. <laughs> well, the Native Americans called him Kid Carson. And the reason they call him Kid Carson because he made it a point to kill all the kids when he went into their 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 places. African Americans <laughs> caged. <laughs> you, you you've heard the expression. People say oh, it was George Floyd and who said, "I can't breathe." And, and, and it, it took off. Well, the first time the language or those words, I can't breathe, was uttered, wasn't by George Floyd in 2020. It was, it was voiced by black people who were in these ships that were coming from Africa, in, packed in like sardines, in these ships where people defecated on themselves, women periods came on. The, the stench was so, powerful that people in their native languages were saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And once we understand I can't breathe is part of a historical reality for our people, it, 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 it will put to an end the lie. And the lie is that the problems black people are having are new, it's just not true. It's just not true. Fred Hampton murdered, murdered in his sleep, in his bed in 1969. Mm -hmm. Rihanna Taylor murdered while at her home in her bed. I mean, this is not, you know, we, we've got to know the history to know that this is not a sudden emergence. In fact, in fact, uh, I tell people this all the time. 
if black police officers killed white people at the rate that white police officers killed black people, man, white people wouldn't stand for it. You know, the, the argument that's used mostly by uh, police officers who kill black people is the following. Uh, I felt my life was in imminent danger. You got to say it. it's on a cue card. You got to say it. Yeah. Well, you try having black people, black police officers killing white people, and then say, I felt my life was in imminent danger. You'll see what I mean. And, and black people, black police officers know better. Mm -hmm. they, know what, they know what the line is. They're not going to cross over that line. And so we have this. In fact, there's a black police officer who was saluted during the breach of the U.S. Capitol this year. Yeah, and they saluted him because they said that he, you know, he, he was able to get the crowd that was coming after uh, supposedly the congressional members who were in the Senate chambers to lure, lure them away from it. But the reason he was able to do it because he was black and they were calling him nigger. Right, and, that nigger. Yep. and the racism allowed him to be able to distract them. But people don't talk about it. It's just outright racism that took place. And I don't know anybody, black or white, who if you told them that on January 6, 2021, that instead of the insurrectionists and the so-called extremists and the white nationalists, uh, Instead of them being the ones to breach the security, it was Black Panthers or Black Lives Matter or Black people. The number of dead people would have been incredible. And President Biden acknowledged that. He made it very clear that race in 2021 makes a difference who lives and who dies. We have issues with our courts. We don't have judges representing us. And a lot of people don't follow the court system. I, I have a show, You Be the Judge, and of course, friend of yours, Marilyn Pierre, and Judge Barbara, um, um, we are talking about how they're trying to silence voter suppression to allow the judges to be put on the courts. We are missing a lot of our system. People are not focusing on the judicial system, the, the, the executive branch, and the legislative branch. We are missing so many of those pieces. And once you, there's a, something that happened um, <clears throat> this year, and most people didn't even catch it. There's an expression, it's called jury nullification. Mm -hmm. Jury nullification something means that regardless of what the facts or the evidence are, the jury's going to acquit you. And in American history, right. there's numerous examples of that. Emmett Till's murderers were acquitted. Mm -hmm. Acquitted. Mm -hmm. It's called jury notification. Trevon Martin murderer was acquitted. It's called jury notification. Despite what the evidence is, we let you walk. If you happen to be, uh, the victims have to be people of color. When the United States Senate during the impeachment trial, gave President Trump jury nullification. Right. The whole world saw it. All of these examples of crimes yeah. being committed, and despite that, a ma overwhelmingly majority white senators said, not guilty, not guilty. What that will do for our criminal justice system and the way black people will behave I mean, you, you can't. The lie has been exposed. This notion, equal justice on the law. Anybody who believes that had Barack Obama done one tenth of one percent of Donald Trump, what he did, nobody's confused what would have happened to no. Barack Obama. This is in 2021. Remember, this is not 1954. <laughs> this is 2021, where the world sees. That if you're white and you do these crimes, you get treated this way. If you're black, you get treated another way. As much as I am against political corruption, and I don't support it at all, anybody who paid any attention to the Baltimore trial of former Baltimore mayor uh, Pew, hmm. they would discover one thing. On the same exact panel was a former 
uh, state senator by the name of Jim, Jim Kelly, who got contracts worth millions of dollars, and he's never been indicted, prosecuted, or maligned in the press. He's been able to walk away. And then people She's who to testify somehow end up ends up dead. <laughs> yeah. And 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 we've got to start asking why. And once you do the why question, not the what, but the why, uh, why. it goes to what Malcolm talks about comprehension. There's reasons certain things are occurring in our nation. And we've got to ask questions. And the other thing is you well know our leadership. You said it earlier, and I like what you said. Don't depend on some savior. It's not going to be no one leader that's going to come and suddenly solve our problems. Here's a uh, typical question. I teach a course called the Psychology of Racism at local community college. And I would ask students the following question, black, white, and otherwise. <clears throat> Do you think Barack Obama is an intelligent man? And they would all say, absolutely. Of course he's intelligent. Then I said, well, what do you think of a Minister Louis Farrakhan? You think he's an intelligent man? Oh yeah, he's an intelligent man. So what about Reverend Jesse Jack? Oh yeah, he's an intelligent man. I said, well then can, can any of you answer this question for me? Since all three men live in Chicago and they're all intelligent, why don't you think the three of them ever meet and talk about what can we collectively do to address the problems of our people? And once you start answering that question, mm -hmm. you're going to find that phenomena is not limited to Minister Farrakhan, Reverend Jackson, or President Obama. Right. If you come to the state of Maryland, there's a black lieutenant governor, there's a black mayor in Baltimore City, there's a black county executive in Howard County, one in Prince George's County. They don't come together collectively either and ask in our respective positions as black people, what can we do? And then you ask this question, Dr. Ball. <laughs> We had a major disturbance. I'm getting shivers because I, I know, I, you know, I, yes, go. Yeah, we had a major disturbance in Baltimore. <laughs> How would you hear this? In Baltimore, Maryland. Black colleges and universities exist in Baltimore, Maryland. Why do you think these black institutions didn't have a round table to talk about the causes and effects of the riot? Silence. Yeah, it was complete silence. And if the intelligentsia in our communities are not doing it, I suggest very strongly that people who want to see change need to understand the change must come from within. Mm -hmm. Our savior is not going to come riding in on the horse. We have to. Jesse Jackson once said, "Nobody will save us from us for us, but us." And there's a lot of truth to that. Mm -hmm. We have to take the responsibility for our own freedom and our own survival. And we've got to ask questions. In 1929, my mother was 13. And I had to ask her this question. How did black people survive the Great Depression? There wasn't any welfare programs in 1929. There were no social programs in 1929. Racism was rampant, <laughs> rampant. How did black people survive? And my mother said, we survived because we turn toward each other, not on each other. We learn to, those of us who were farmers, grew, grew food. Those of us who were watermen and fishermen, we used the sea. Those of us who had the power to sew clothes, we bought it among ourselves. We survived as a people, depending on each other and making it possible. I am going to leave it at that. I want you to get out, get some air. Thank you. I'm absolutely love, and I will talk to you later, sooner than later. But please, I hope everyone enjoys, but not just enjoys, but understand and comprehend. Ask Thank questions. you, sir. So have a good night. God bless, man. God bless.